Hi, welcome to the Indie Wine Podcast. My name is Matt Wood, and this is episode 21. Today, we'll be talking with Daniel Callen of Slamdance Cooperative Wines in Paso Robles. Daniel, along with his partner Anna and Frankie the dog, stopped by on a recent trip to Northern California. We talked about Daniel's experience working harvests in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, as well as harvests in Paso. One of the larger influences on Daniel is Old California, and more specifically, pre-prohibition and the blended wines many of the wineries made. We're talking about the California Burgundies, Clarets, Hawks. You can't see me, but I'm putting air quotes around those. A blended wine that shows terroir of the region is what Daniel is after, and at least for the time being, he's sticking with this one wine. We also discuss the wine press and the cellar by Ricksford and Daniel's fermentation techniques. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Here we go. I mean, last week we had our first weekend over like, or the first days, I guess, over a hundred. And was yeah. like, usually we've had several of those already by July, you know? Okay. And, um, so it's been a very mild summer for us so far. Okay. And, I mean, who knows? It could switch pretty drastically and pretty quickly, but- yeah. um, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So far, it's shaping up to be sort of a, a moderate season, which um, like 2021 yeah. was a great season for for Paso. I, I think a lot of Paso producers hated it because it's like super cool. And like, I mean, a lot of people just picked when the frost came in like November. They couldn't okay. push stuff that long. But for me, it was the first year where I'd go out and sample grapes and it was like, oh, like, we can pick this next week, not yesterday. You know, it was yeah. like everything was super calm, even. It was just a very well spaced out harvest versus 22 was just a nightmare. You know, yeah. it was just, it was over by the middle of September, pretty much. Right. Um, <laughs> and hopefully 2023 shapes up a little bit more like 2021 than, yeah. than 2022. Mildew pressure's been up a little bit, but, you know, we had late rains. We had rains in, do we have rain in May or April? Okay. This year? Yeah. We had rain in May. Yeah, I think we had, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, usually everyone's trying to get into the vineyards right after the last rain, but kind of it was such a wet winter. And most of the vineyards out there, just the way, like, the calcareous shale, like, decomposes, like, you, it, like, turns into this pretty gnarly clay. And mm, in the winter, okay. it sticks like nobody's business. So getting a tractor in is really hard to do a, but and also just like tears up the vineyard trying to if you try and work it too early yeah so everyone's been behind on weed abatement and sprays and everything so um so how'd you get into wine i was when i was at university um i went for track and field and cross country uh, okay. more than academics really so mm -hmm. i was on the athletics team there and when i would come home from the summer my mom was kind of like you need to find a a job and just like not sit around the house and then go running in the evening when it's cool and sleep in too late and stuff like that. So, uh, she kind of pushed me into, she was like, there's a winery down the street hiring in a tasting room. And okay. so I picked up a couple of hours a week, uh, just during the summers working in a tasting room, didn't have any experience with wine whatsoever. We weren't really a wine drinking family. Um, is this in Virginia? This is in Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of kept doing that every summer and eventually sort of identified more with the dudes, you know, the cellar rats who were kind of lurking mm -hmm. around and uh, than I did with the sort of, you know, more retiree aged people working in the tasting sure. room. Okay. So uh, slowly worked my way backwards, you know, just hopping out on bottling lines and then doing vineyard work. Uh, and spent summers, you know, just shoot thinning and, and training and, uh, and then eventually graduated and it was kind of, you know, post 2008, everything was still a little bit dicey in the economy. And mm -hmm. the winemaker offered me a job as a cellar rat for, for harvest. And that when that ended, you know, harvest came to an end and kind of the layoffs came through and the winemaker was like, you know what, you now that you've worked a harvest somewhere, you can work one anywhere and mm -hmm. he was like you should just send out your resume to everybody in the southern hemisphere you know he's like you'll send out 50 and you'll get 
48 rejection or you won't hear back from 48 yeah. people you'll hear a no from one person and someone might offer you a job so that's kind of what i did and he also gave me another good piece of advice he said you know he was like i've never worked retail but it's and something i don't really understand if i could do it all over again i would work in a wine shop for a mm, little bit so okay. so i got a job in the wine shop and uh which is really interesting you know the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you were just selling wine on the floor, but sort of Monday through Thursday, you'd see, you know, five or six reps a day, and they each mm -hmm. had two to eight bottles of wine that they wanted to taste you through, and then you were in charge of deciding what you could, what you should buy, what you could move, um, you know, just making the, building the store's portfolio, so. Yeah, plus getting to taste a lot of wine, I imagine. Definitely, definitely. And a lot of different areas. Definitely, and, and I was already attracted to certain wines more than okay. others at that point. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of generic California wine and, you know, mm -hmm. just stuff that was making into Virginia. You know, it's not a big market the way New York or Chicago right. is or San Francisco, but kind of one of the really important wines was actually the Lioko the Lioko mm. wines were in the shop. Yeah. And I was just really interested in, I mean, the wines were great, but then also to the, the transparency of the labels where it told you, you know, all the mm -hmm. chemistry. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And that kind of put me down the path of slightly more low intervention wines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not even sure why I was attracted to that more than I was to, you know, Colt Napa Cab, which we also right. sold in the shop. Um, but then the guy who I was working for, Nate Walsh, he, him and his family have a winery in Virginia now called Walsh Family Wines. He'd also studied literature at university just like I had and had kind of throughout my employment sort of fed me, you know, literature every week on okay. wines, so, yeah. you know, whether it was Jamie Goode's book or, I mean, he gave me Ben Dune so long, which oh, yeah. as like a 22 <laughs> year old is kind of a, you know probably had way more of an effect on me than it should have. Um, <laughs> I mean, even like, you know, the, the movie that just, or the TV show that just came out, The Drops of uh, God. Oh, Drops of God, he yeah. He gave me like the little manga before, you know, that was yeah. like one of my, his goofier suggestions, but it was like, it was just a very informal wine education because I didn't have that mm -hmm. formal training. So, um, so I was already kind of leaning in that direction. And then... While I was at the wine shop, I, you know, was sending resumes out everywhere. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, I didn't really know what I was looking for in an employer. And I didn't really know how to go around finding an employer. Um, so I was just looking at, like, I didn't know you should actually actively go out and seek out sort of the best producers and mm -hmm. ask them. Um, and this is still just trying to find kind of some harvest gigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so I was just answering advertisements on, you know, wine biz basically, mm -hmm. and ended up getting a job in Australia. And so in the winter of 2013, I went down to Australia. It was my first time out of the country. So it's kind of cool. That was, you know, my avenue to start traveling. And, yeah. um, and then, yeah, started harvest hopping from there. Okay, so, nice. So where are some of the places you ended up? So I worked in Australia at a, and it was funny, like, uh, I didn't know, and that went in very idealistically. I went to the Adelaide Hills and worked for a winery called Bird in Hand and making 400 tons of wine, you know, medium-sized mm -hmm. winery. And everything was a little bit dicey, a little bit jerry-rigged, even though it was like this sort of semi-premium wine, luxury wine facade mm -hmm. you know, behind the scenes. It was kind of... And I guess most wineries are like that. Like the cellar work is never as glamorous as the front of house. Sure. But, uh, you know, for years afterwards, I'd tell people where I'd worked. I was like, oh, yeah, I worked at Bird in Hand. And they're like, oh, you mean the Turd in Hand? Is <laughs> kind of, it kind of just had a notorious <laughs> reputation okay. for, uh, uh, for not being a great place to work. And, okay. And I loved at the time, I you know, I was working night shift and uh, – just going to the local pub after work and meeting, you know, local Aussie hooligans, mm -hmm. and, uh, drinking way too much, you know, Coopers. And uh, and then, you know, again, Harvest was kind of coming to an end and the writing was on the wall. They were kind of doing 
a series of layoffs every week okay. that would kind of let people a couple of people go. I think there's 20 interns or something like that. Okay. And uh, so I, before I I got the axe myself, I kind of looked around and found another job in New Zealand. So I hopped up to New Zealand nice. and worked in a big Sauvignon Blanc factory. Um, I still haven't quite recovered from <laughs> from that. Uh, I think we made a th- we processed a thousand tons of Sauvignon Blanc a day every day for five or six weeks. Wow! And uh, I mean, it just came in twenty five ton dump trucks, and you know, got yeah. dumped into a giant receiving hopper, and it was all machine picked. And I mean, the stuff came in like soup, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that's kind of the the reason for that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc style of like overtly grassy and gooseberry mm. it's like oh maybe it's a little like un <laughs> you know unintentional skin contact yeah. in the back of a dump truck yeah. um <laughs> yeah it's gotta be like a sisyphus kind of thing yeah. like ev- every day it right it arrives <laughs> right and i got lucky I, I ended up working for the team that was working doing pinot noir but uh so we were a little bit smaller crew the ferments were a little bit smaller still you know 20 ton ferments but uh the workload was much smaller and much more varied. We kind of did everything from receival to inoculations to pressing, cap management. Um, whereas I, I had a, one poor friend who, you know, a French girl who worked at Montpellier and she got put on the weigh bridge and all she did was weigh grapes and write down the weight and send them oh. to the winery. And that was kind of the extent of her, her harvest. So it was a really good harvest for seller skills, you know, mm-hmm. not a lot of intellectual sort of thought behind the wines uh for me i mean I'm maybe the the winemaker and the executive winemaker and for them i'm sure there was a little bit more but for us on the ground level you know it's kind of hard to see the big picture and, mm-hmm. and we were bottling different different blocks and different cuvées but uh it was very much just processing for us down down on the ground yeah so. you think it was a good experience seeing something seeing it made on that scale for and sure. in that way even if it's not something you're interested For in sure. at all yeah no it's between those those two vintages the australian and the new zealand one it was it kind of eliminated like 95 percent of the world of wine making for me mm. i kind of realized i wasn't interested in making wine like that and um you know it's, it's fine for other people and everyday drinking you know we need those sort of commodity wines in the world mm-hmm. where you know we can't we can't drink uh super serious wine every night you know it's and for me like when i drink wine i definitely want to when i drink wine seriously like i want to think about it seriously and it's just yeah. a lot of thinking hard about it and i don't want to do that every night of the week um so it was good for that and it was also great for seller skills i mean we had like this whole hall of just every single different pump that's ever been made you okay. know Waukesha's and francesca's and air pumps and mono pumps and we had, you know, different presses. There's a reverse vacuum drum for lees filtration. And then just the mechanics of it, like figuring out, you know, how to pump wine literally 400 meters across the winery. That's, that's right. how big the winery was. And pump into yeah. a, a hard line that's fixed on the wall and, you know, start a timer and run to the other end of the winery and hook up your pump and or your hoses and hook it up to, you know, a tanker that was hauling wine away for bottling or for bulk wine or whatever it was. It was very intense seller work and seller skills, but yeah. uh, definitely learned a lot in that department as well. So, Did you come back in to uh, Northern Hemisphere and work a harvest after? Yeah. Those? I So I, after New Zealand and, you know, basically three harvests in a row, I was a little bit tired. And so I went and uh, was going to do some vacationing in Southeast Asia, end up, in Vietnam, got a job bartending in Cambodia for a few months. And then the idea was to come back to Virginia. You know, all my family was still there. And, mm-hmm. you know, the wine scene was just really getting going there. But the problem was kind of everyone was starting a winery. So there's more wineries than there were grapes. So there's a lot of competition for that. There's also, you know, a lot of competition for jobs. So, mm-hmm. um, so I was hoping to get a job, but that kind of fell through. And I ended up actually... Um, my boss at the wine shop had a winemaker from Paso Robles come through and whose wine they were selling. And, you know, my boss was like, hey, we have this guy who uh, has been doing like the harvest hop. If you need an intern, 
um, let me put you in touch with him. And so I got in touch with uh, Thatcher Winery and yeah, I was actually in Cambodia and, you know, managing this backpackers and <laughs> bar and, you know, Sherman wanted to talk, uh, Sherman Thatcher wanted to talk and it was like 9 a.m. for him, but I think it was 2 a.m. for me okay. and, you know, full on backpackers, you know, party raging in the background yeah. and I'm trying to sit down and have like a, <laughs> like real, like FaceTime interview. Yeah. And, um, but so we ended up connecting that way and I went out in... August of 2013 um, to work harvest there and got along well with with Sherman and but it was you know again it was just a, a harvest internship and and mm -hmm. once harvest kind of ended work was the work dried up and yeah I had other plans so I I wanted to catch another harvest in the southern hemisphere I had already burned through my easy working vi holiday visas for okay. Australia, New Zealand, so uh, South Africa was a place I could go and I didn't need a visa. So I ended up getting a job in South Africa to go work for a winery called Dornier, which again, still I wasn't sure what I was looking for and just answering advertisements. And again, another slightly larger winery, medium size, mm -hmm. certainly smaller than uh, New Zealand, but again, about 400 tons, I think. Again, the winemaking was sort of typical, you know, inoculations, additions, mm -hmm. you know, nothing super manipulative, but it was just conventional winemaking and, and sure. sound winemaking. But the woman who was my boss was Janine Craven, and uh, her and her husband, Mick Craven, uh, were really switched on. They had both worked harvest at Wind Gap at the time, so they okay. were very... And this was kind of the time when, you know, the new California wine was sort of becoming a thing that mm -hmm. was talked about, and... The South Africans were very in tune with what was happening in America. I think they saw okay. a lot of similarities between what was happening with them and what was happening with us in California. So Janine, sort of at the end of my harvest, kind of told me to take a week-long vacation. So me and a, a buddy, Tyler Knight, who's a Canadian guy, um, has a, a winery up in British Columbia now. We rented this old, like, 1970s Volkswagen Beetle. Like, okay. The floor was literally like rotted out, like rusted <laughs> out. And uh, we just like toured around the Swartland and went and visited Adi Badenhorst and Stumpy mm -hmm. Myers and kind of this uh, Craig Hawkins, kind of the who's who of natural wine. Yeah. And not natural, not all natural wine, but I mean, certainly Stumpy and Craig were kind of in the natural wine category. But Adi was, you know, wild fermentations and limited, you know, messing around with the wines. I don't know if he would consider himself natural wine or you know, sort of classically styled. Sure. Um, uh, and that just blew my mind. You know, it was the first time I'd seen native fermentations in action. You know, it was the first time I saw skin contact, white fermentations. You know, I remember Adi's assistant winemaker at the time, they'd had a big bumper crop harvest. And so they had Chen Blanc kind of coming out of their ears. So they bought a bunch of used secondhand barrels. You know, they had mm. these beautiful old Fudras that they bought from the big co-op in the Swartland. And uh, and then they had all these barrels that they had bought secondhand to kind okay. of emergency fill. And uh, I remember him just saying like, you know, ah, these 225 liters are total shit. And he just kicked one off the crush pad and it like rolled down the hill and fell apart and like barrel staves are going everywhere. Okay. And just so it, everything was so cowboy, everything was so energetic and electric and uh, everyone was on a mission and just like making it happen. You know, it's yeah. all small producers, their first couple of vintages, uh, really to say it's avant-garde sounds a little bit pretentious, but just, just so far ahead of the game and, mm -hmm. and really excited both me and Tyler and and so you know my visa there was coming to an end of my stay and uh work again was drying up so uh, I'd still been in touch with Sherman we talked about maybe me coming back and I told him I'd be interested in coming back for another harvest and he mm -hmm. said great you know uh here's a you know a full-time job as seller master which I you know not having this formal education I felt uh super lucky to have mm -hmm. that offer. Um, so I went back and worked there 
and you know just made the wines at Thatcher for almost ten years. I think yeah. um, worked ten vintages there, and um, and worked really you know hard to kind of the wines at first were very much sort of the the Paso style, you know, pretty ripe, rich, um, you know, kind of a and the portfolio was a smattering of everything of, you know, Zinfandel and Petit Syrah through to, you know, GSM blends, varietal bottlings of Rhone, Rhone varieties. Um, you know, there's Bord a Bordeaux program. You know, there's port wine that we made. It was just kind of all over the place. And, and again, kind of more tra traditional, conventional winemaking. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked really hard to kind of dry out the wines, move to wild, you know, indigenous or native fermentations, sure, yeah. moved away completely from any sort of additions um, besides sulfur, uh, you know, really kind of moved away from new cooperage. You know, those first years we were maybe buying 50 new barrels a year. By the end, we were buying four new barrels just for, you know, replacing cooperage. And also we had a couple lots that, you know, just, you know, you could put new oak on, you know, it was one vineyard of dry farmed head trained Cabernet on St. George okay. on like 12 by 12 foot spacing, you know, kind of exactly how people tell you not to plant Cabernet. Sure. <laughs> uh, that just, that vineyard just soaked up new oak like nobody's business. So those, in the end, those were the only barrels that we were buying. Um, made a lot of progress, you know, brought the alcohols down quite a bit. Okay. Um, so, but while I was doing that work, I was also, you know, not quite done traveling and uh, wanted to go back to South Africa and kind of had this this three way interaction where I saw an advertisement for uh, a seller hand for the vintage with all hype vineyards, um, okay. and then I asked Janine Craven, you know, what she thought of them, and she was like, "He's one of my best mates from." from university he's making amazing wines definitely shoot him an email so she also put in a good word and then i randomly ran a party in paso ran into a girl who'd worked for adi badenhorst and she was like you know what me and my boyfriend are looking at a vintage in south africa we need kind of a, a vintage with two positions we can't just okay. you know and and the all lights only had one position available so she was like you should go look at at working there. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's kind of, you know, all signs pointed in that direction. Sure. Yeah. So in 2015, I went to go work for Chris and Suzanne Allite. And that was like the vintage where it all came together. Like from the first time I tried their wine, their first wine cartology, I was just like, okay. I didn't know what I was looking for, but this was, this was it. And, yeah. Um, it was just Chenin Blanc and Semillon. It was only old bush vines. It was all dry farmed it was really natural winemaking but done with a you know they both had Stellenbosch University winemaking educations mm -hmm. and they'd worked in Australia and Bordeaux and the Mosul so they had very technical backgrounds as well and kind of you know that you know the enough knowledge to do the natural wine thing really cleanly and correctly and um and they just became great friends, and I learned so much from them. And I ended up going back to work for them. In, so I worked in 15, 2016, and 2017 with them. And every year I learned something different. I mean, the first year was just wine making. The second year was kind of business, mm -hmm. um, learning, you know, seeing the business grow, seeing at what they really got to a point where their success kind of outgrew what they could mentally handle and okay. you know, they had the the brand almost blew up you know they were making this really serious white wine called cartology and then they you know in the search for old bush vine shannon they were kind of finding old Cinso vineyards old mm. carignan vineyards old tinta baraka vineyards old syrah vineyards and it was too good just to leave on the table so they ended up you know uh making a small red wine program, which quickly became a large red wine program. And, but they always felt like it was a distraction. It was such mm. a good lesson of like, you know, they had this wine with a mission, you know, the, the, their main wine cartology was a regional wine of only Chenin and Semillon, multi vineyards, multi appellations. Mm -hmm. 
but they were trying to just describe the Western Cape of South Africa to the best of their abilities. Okay. And that was another really important lesson of like how important the village level wines are, especially in a region like South Africa that, you know, democracy only came in 94 for them. So they'd really only had at that time 20 years of trying to explain South African wine to the rest of the world because, you know, because of apartheid and restrictions and sanctions on, on mm-hmm. exports, they weren't really able to get wine out to the rest of the world. So, and that was part of the energy from about the place and was just that, that need to kind of want to prove to the rest of the world that the wines were serious. It wasn't just bag and box co-op wines. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. And then, you know, they also, got, you know, they got to the point where the red wine was successful, but really distracting from what they felt like was the bigger, more important mission. And just seeing someone sacrifice, you know, that, that viable economic, you know, that, that, that stream of revenue income terminating it for mm-hmm. the betterment of the quality of the, the brand and the, the portfolio. And, you know, just that sacrifice was really impressive to me and really had a big mark on me. And then yeah, it must have been interesting to see it, see how that plays out. Definitely, and, definitely. And then uh, I just went, I went back in twenty twenty one to, no, sorry, twenty twenty two to visit them. And then this January, I went back to go work a harvest with them again oh, okay. in twenty twenty three. And so it was really cool to see them come full circle, where you know they'd been negotiant for so many years, and now they're starting to get to the point where they own vineyards. The farming the South Africans are doing is so far ahead of what we're doing here in California. Like okay. just the conversations about that we're having about no till and all of those things, like they were having those conversations ten years ago and went through all the growing pains of, you know, wow. oh, when you turn a fifty year old dry farmed vineyard, you know, you, you go from disking it for fifty years and then one year you stop it and the vineyard dies, you know, how do you actually farm in the most regenerative way possible without killing vineyards and any idea what triggered those conversations so much earlier there? I think just the realities of, you know, their water's more of an issue for them. Okay. E- the scarcity yeah. of everything is more of an issue for them. There was so many bush vines and, you know, they, they, they didn't have in California the way we can kind of prop up vineyards, uh, whether it's through irrigation or, or whatever. Or if you have the finances to just replant when a mm-hmm. when a vineyard isn't doing well, you know they didn't really have those things. So, and again, you know, I think when democracy came, you know, b- before it was hard for them to travel on a South African passport, and so that generation, you know, just a, a few years older than me, they were like the first generation to really go out and travel, and they went everywhere, and they okay. worked so many vintages. Everybody had worked in. France and Australia, California, Oregon, South America. They just went everywhere and, you know, they really brought back a lot of ideas and everyone was bouncing ideas off each other. So I think that conversation started early. um, And yeah, and it just, and it's funny because, you know, it's, I feel like a lot of the voices that we hear in California today are still really recent. Yeah, you know, I feel mm-hmm. like we haven't really started talking about this stuff until maybe 2015 was people were starting to talk about it. And now the last 2018, 19 was really when the conversation got really heated up. And by then they were already uh, really dialing in their farming. So I wonder what it was. If it was just the, the droughts of those, it's been ongoing droughts in California right, right. since <laughs> forever. But right. if it was that 15, 16, right. been going on a few years of, of drought at that right, time and right. everybody trying to figure out new ways right. to take care of these vineyards. Right, right. I guess the push to just more low intervention styles of farming and winemaking right, also right. that been happening. Yeah. And it's kind of worked backwards, you know, where we started, you know, the natural wine movement, the conversation down started more on winemaking techniques and has sort of gone backwards from there into um, more issues of farming. And maybe yeah. it's just, as the movement sort of ages and people are suddenly able to actually start affording their own vineyards, you know, or able to control the farming more than just being negotiant. Mm-hmm. Um, 
maybe it's just an issue that's that's more important now than it was, or that they can influence more now than they could 10 years ago. Yeah, and I, I think probably the people that are even more negotiant level, as, as farmers have more people asking for a lighter touch yeah. or, or working more organically, right. or biodynamic, right. it's like, oh, it's, it's the fourth person this year that's right. asked me a, about that. And so Especially it starts to kind to of like more. catch on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If they're willing to yeah. pay extra per ton or yeah. acreage, and, what have you. And that was another thing about Chris Allheit was, you know, he was like Robin Hood for these farmers. And we would go out and <laughs> we'd be picking and, you know, the next door neighbor would show up with coffee because, you know, they're like, Chris always paid more than anyone else for his grapes. Okay. He would pay for cover crop seeds before the season. So, you know, just mm -hmm. literally investing in someone else's vineyard to get the farming, you know, if the farmer couldn't afford, you know, a better team of pruners, he would make up the difference. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just a financial transaction. It was really like building relationships with these yeah. farmers and, you know, people and, um, uh, yeah. So. Yeah. It's kind of how you get farmers on your side right. by and large. It's right. Right. And a little bit of love goes a long way, you know, it's yeah. especially in South Africa, but I think also here in California, you know, you look at some of these vineyards that are kind of neglected and kind of beat up. And when someone shows a little bit of interest, it, it can go a long way. So, mm -hmm. so how'd you get, kind of interested in the, I guess, the older style of California wine, sort mm. of pre-prohibition California, older California varieties. Right. What was the thing that kind of grabbed you about that? Well, working with Chris or Butch is nickname, uh, you know, with his project, he was only looking through, he was only interested in working with grapes that had like a long standing history in in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And for him, Semyon and Chen Blanc, Muscat, Pontac, those grapes had all arrived in the 1650s in, in South Africa. Okay. So they had super long history there. And I think there was a lot of frustration when he would see kind of these historic varieties, you know, the traditional way even of planting the vineyards, you know, wide spacing, bush vines, being ripped out for international varieties of, you know, yeah. mostly Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay and in the hot desert climates, you know. It, yeah. I think that was really frustrating for him. And so he kind of had this obsession with trying to, you know, it wasn't just about making wine. It was also about preserving kind of heritage and regional identity and all of these things. And and he had worked with a guy named Dave Wilson uh, in South Africa. And then he, in that... Butch and Suzanne had gone to Napa to work one year and they'd lived with Dave in a house and Dave's family had kind of one of the last plantings of Valdegay in the okay. Napa Valley. Okay. And uh, I think at the time the wine went to, like, I think it went into the prisoner maybe. Oh, really? Uh, I okay. think so. Okay. Um, and today it's a little bit more respected. Dave makes his own wine from it. I, I think uh, I think Michael Cruz makes wine from it. But back in 2017, sort of my last vintage with Butch, you know, we had a conversation and he wanted to start an American project based around uh, sort of historic California varieties. Mm, and okay. I had never ever heard of Valdegay, you know, and so we we had a lot of conversations about that. Um, and that kind of just started the ball rolling with, you know, Valdegay used to be Napa Gamme, and I think there used to be four or 5,000 acres in the state of California. Everybody mm -hmm. used to make one. I mean, I have some old balls of Mandavi, you know, quote unquote Napa Gamme. Sure, yeah. Uh, from the 70s, you know, Billy used to make uh, their burgundies were usually like when Andre Chelichev was making the wines, they were half Mondeuse, half Valdegay. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of interesting and sad that we lost this sort of historical grape variety. And, and it's the same story with a lot of grape varieties in California, mm -hmm. you know, between the, you know, the legal pressures of prohibition and then the economic pressures of, you know, 
kind of the Parker administration and just sort of that, inter- you know, the, the globalization of wine, you know. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, some of these bottles, you know, when it's labeled Burgundy, people don't really know what's what's in it. It doesn't right. really get its its name out there so much when it was before varietal naming. Right, and, right. But when you read like old literature about California wine, it was, you know, people weren't making varietal Cabernet or varietal Pinot or varietal right. Chardonnay. You know, it was, they were just trying to ape sort of the the wine styles of the old world yeah, with whatever they had available. So, mm-hmm. you know, the Burgundies were usually a little bit darker, you know, Petit Syrah, Carignan, Negrette oftentimes. Um, the Clarets were usually Zinfandel based and a little mm-hmm. bit lighter, lower alcohol. Um, you know, and then you'd see things like, you know, California Hawk, you know, yeah. just kind of. Yeah, that's what I was just, I was just thinking. Yeah, that one, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> supposed to be Riesling, but it's like Palomino and a little bit of Muscat. You <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> um, so, you know, I kind of, Butch kind of infected me with this kind of resentment towards losing mm-hmm. the, these varieties, this diversity. And again, you know, it wasn't just varieties we lost with prohibition. You know, we also lost winemaking techniques, uh, winemaking, mm-hmm. you know, culture, uh, pruning, you know, all these yeah. things, kind of the artisanal way of doing things was really lost. And, you know, after repeal, the industry geared up in a big way. And, you know, UC Davis did a great job of kind of trying to get everything back on track, but it was definitely more, you know, there was more of an interest in how do you make technically correct wine for mm-hmm. the market rather than um, uh, how do you make an artisanal product yeah and, it was a little more geared towards high production 100 percent, yeah yeah and clean and clean costs yeah, yeah yeah you know and it's kind of just once you start digging and you look you know you look at old grape acreage reports and mm-hmm. you see you know there used to be thousands of acres of barbera thousands of acres of black malvoisie or Cinso, and mm-hmm. the mission vine of course you know it's uh so it's just interesting and and at the same time, I was looking at that historical sort of precedent of what was what had happened in California and making wine in Paso. I kind of felt like we were sort of repeating that same mistake on a smaller, localized level. Where okay, Paso, I love it. You know, it's a, my adopted home, uh, and it's one of those things where sometimes you know when you're an immigrant, you're a little bit more patriotic than mm. you know the native born. So I'm sure I've. I kind of have a disproportionate love for the area. Um, but, you know, I kind of also have critiques about the area as well. And, you know, the reality is we kind of go through these, we go through a lot of personality changes in yeah. Paso where, you know, the 1970s, we were like the spot for Zinfandel. And by the 90s, you know, the Rhone movement had kind of started and we really latched onto that, Hospice to Rhone, everything. Um, you know, Talbot's Creek was really instrumental mm-hmm. in that. And that was all well and good, but now we're kind of going through this, you know, third change where everybody's kind of pulling out all the Rhone stuff. You see a lot of the companies from Napa coming down and, you know, I think people have sort of recognized that you can grow Cabernet cheaper in Paso than you can in Napa. Okay. And so there's a lot of bigger organizations coming through and trying to capture that semi-premium luxury wine market, you know, where, okay, for the guy who doesn't want to shell out 150 bucks every night for Napa cab, but might shell out, you know, 25 to 40 bucks for, you know, Paso Cabernet that's kind of dressed up to look like a Napa bar. Sure, yeah. um, And I think, you know, that, that resentment that, Butch had about losing old Shannon to Sauvignon Blanc. I kind of have the same resentment about losing kind of these historic vineyards in Paso to, and not even historic vineyards, but just the culture of dry farming, the culture of certain varieties, um, losing that to just tight space Cabernet that's, you know, going to the the middle of a grocery store shelf is it it chafes a little bit so yeah. uh yeah so in 2020 i kind of you know i'd stayed home for a couple of years i'd skipped my international visits and and harvests and um 
you know, COVID certainly helped with that as well. Mm -hmm. I had a lot more time to just sit down and read and, um, I'd kind of been sitting on an idea for a few years and a lot of grapes were just sort of falling into my lap through my work at Thatcher, you know, okay. where, um, Kudos to Thatcher for, you know, being willing to work with Valdegay and Negret and things like this. Um, but uh, they were going into varietal bottlings, and that was great. Okay. But my concern was people were just drinking the wine as they were every other bottle of wine for its kind of varietal brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the one hand, you have people drink, you know, reach for a bottle of Cabernet because it's, digestible they understand you know what it is they're getting when they buy a bottle of cabernet at whatever price point you know it's kind of you know what to expect yeah. and on the flip side i think there's also the another demographic that is a little bit more adventurous and wants to try new things um but i was a little bit frustrated that people weren't buying the wines to kind of un try to understand their region and we're just buying it okay. to try a new varietal Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's why you pay big bucks for real wine. That's why we obsess over wine is, you know, if the wine doesn't do like the intellectual work of defining the territory that you're working in, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's worth paying the $75 or whatever it is. And I see a lot of bottlings in, in those kind of rarefied price ranges mm -hmm. um, in Paso. And, and, you know, it's great. You know, people are putting a lot of work and effort into it, but I'm not sure it does the sort of intellectual job that I prefer if I'm going to shell out that amount of money. Okay. So, and so it's kind of, you know, you kind of, I didn't have any examples of the sorts of wines I wanted. That I thought explain my region well, uh, explain the history well of the region. You know, it's very hard to find old balls of Paso wine. And mm -hmm. part of that problem is because of that personality shift, you know, the the brands kind of don't survive. You're, all the old Zinn houses in Paso are defunct, you know. Are they? Okay. I mean, Turley is there, but right. they took over the Pacenti winery, and mm -hmm. Pacenti had been there for, you know, decades, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and we're a very strong wine house. And um, I think of who else, like the Rota Winery, which has kind of been – Redeveloped and but you know, it's a historic vineyard, historically mm -hmm. Zinfandel and kind of California Burgundies and you know, jug wines. Um, you know, that has gone through several changes over the years. You know, it wasn't like in Napa where you can still find bottles of Napa Cab from the 1970s and sure. or whatever it is. Um, it's hard to find old Paso wine and like what the wine, it's hard to understand what the wines were like early on in the winemaking history of the area. Um, yeah. I mean, you can yeah. find the Ridge, Ducey Zins. You can sure. find... That's pretty much it. I mean, uh, there's not much else besides that. Uh, I mean, the, the Turley Bottling is going back to the early 2000s, maybe, but... Um, it's just hard to find what super. was happening in the 70s yeah. and 80s, even. Yeah. And for me, it's kind of hard if you don't understand your past well it's a little bit hard to make intelligent moves into the future and so i kind of just want to work to understand the region and understand kind of the past and so the the first vineyard that i started working with was uh shell creek and with kind of my south african connections sherman my boss at thatcher you know he was like you know if you want to make some chen blanc let's find some and, and we'll do it and uh, so in 2017, we went out to a vineyard. Guy had some grapes for sale, Chenin Blanc, and we kind of signed up. And you know, while we we're kicking the dirt with him, uh, Daniel Sinton, the 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 farmer there, he was like, "Do you guys want any Valdegay?" And Sh <laughs> Sherman was like, "I don't know what that is. I'm not really that interested." And I was like, "Wait, wait, wait! I like I've just had this conversation like two weeks before with Butch, you know, driving yeah. around in the truck." Uh, to pick up grapes about what Valdegay was and the history. So we started working with that vineyard. Um, and then another vineyard we were working with buying, you know, Rhone varietals, talking to the guy, Don Rose. Uh, you know, he had a little bit of Cinso for sale. And 
you know, Cinso, again, one of the more widely planted grapes in South Africa, as far as red wine goes. Mm-hmm. Um, as we're emailing back and forth about the Cinso, he's like, well, all the Rhones are Talbot's Creek material, except for the Cinso. When I planted the vineyard, you know, Talbot's Creek hadn't cleared their Cinso through quarantine. So I used this old, you know, UC Davis Jackson station. Oh, what was called Black Malvoisie. Yeah. Uh, was actually Cinso. And so it's kind of, again, this sort of like pre-prohibition, you know, this this great material, genetic material that's been in California for a long time, you know, 150 years or more. Yeah. Um, and then a, a friend of of ours uh, who maps who, who maps vineyards was doing some mapping out Soleto Vineyard and he kind of contacted us at Thatcher and he was like, you know, I know you guys work with some weird stuff you know, you should contact these guys. And they had both Negret and Cabernet Pfeffer and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, Negret was previously called Pinot St. George. Uh, Cabernet Pfeffer is actually more Tau, but, you know, both those grapes are, Cabernet Pfeffer was a uh, one of the Bordelais grapes that didn't survive uh, phylloxera. And mm-hmm. uh, it was never replanted in Bordeaux, but it kind of had a home in, in California. And yeah, It's weird. It's really concentrated in that, general area yeah yeah, yeah. And, no, and nowhere else in nowhere california else. yeah <laughs> it's, yeah it's, it's very strange yeah but, but cool yeah and then the the negret was you know previously called pinot saint george they thought it was pinot from Nuit saint george for a hundred years oh okay and That's uh wild. okay it wasn't until the 1990s that uc davis did genetic testing they they figured out actually what it was and yeah i think there's a little bit in france but it's doesn't make it into varietal bottlings, and uh, I think it's typically blended with like Malbec. And uh, oh, okay, so that was kind of the jumping off point. Was you know these vineyards kind of falling into my lap, uh, all old historic material stuff that's been in California since the eighteen hundreds, and uh, in twenty twenty I kind of decided to take the leap and yeah. and buy a little bit myself and uh, started my own small wine brand. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's get into the Burgundy. So I guess that's uh, Petit Syrah, Charbonneau, Val de Gay, and Early Burgundy. And as far as I can tell, I think it's the last one that was made before they killed the, the Burgundy program. But okay. Redwood Tank, you think? Maybe. Super Tannic, huh? Oh, it does actually say the Is it on the back? Though. Yeah. Yeah, half petite. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's tough to find Early Burgundy around, too, or... So the name for it, or Bo, or, or, or Bo, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I've only had two bridal bottlings of it. Okay. I think there's some in Sonoma and some in Lodi. Okay. And old it's, vines or younger? You know, I think um, I think old, old World Winery in Sonoma. Okay. I think has some that is older, and I don't know if the I don't know the age of the Lodi. Okay plantings but those are the only two i've ever ever had yeah of it yeah. um there was a winery in livermore that used to make it from from lodi yeah we opened the 74 a few months back and that was in really nice shape mm-hmm. i think a little bit better shape than this even but. okay so you decided to start the wine brand yeah yeah you know it's i really took my time about it and i thought about it for a really long time um, yeah it was just kind of rattling around in your yeah your head for yeah. forever. I think I worked fifteen vintages before I made my first one for myself, and uh, mm-hmm. you know I kind of knew I only had one shot to come out the gates, and uh, there was also just you know frustrations were building up at Thatcher. You know, it's there was a lot of experimentation. It was a great environment to learn a lot early on, mm-hmm. but you know after ten years making five, 6,000 case winery, but making 35 different SKUs. And it felt like, I felt like I was lacking a little bit of focus and I kind okay. of really felt that, and it's, it's not just a problem at Thatch. It's sort of a, it's a reality of a lot of the California wine world, is, mm-hmm. especially with the emphasis on, you know, direct to consumer sales and tasting rooms, you kind of need the, five or six SKUs to fill the tasting room lineup to get someone to pay, you know, a tasting fee. And yeah. if you're doing the club shipment, you need six different bottlings twice a year to 
you know, keep your consumers interested and yeah, and club exclusive. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. And and just that thing of trying to make a wine for every palate and mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of frustrating to me. I you know, because I, I didn't feel like we we're doing the one job that you know a follow fine wine should actually do, which is how do you explain your region to the consumer and. And it, again, you know, not just a, a problem at Thatcher. It's if someone came to me, a sommelier or whoever, and said, you know, give me one bottle of wine to explain Paso, I'd be at a loss. You know, do mm -hmm. I give them a bottle of Tirelli Zinfandel? Do I give them a bottle of Justin Isosceles? Do I give them a bottle of Taubes Esprit? You know, it's just there was not good consensus about what of what the region was about. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's in a lot of ways it's uh brought attention to the reason because again everyone wants to try something new but i feel like in a lot of ways it's also held the region back and you look at a place like santa barbara which arguably has a little bit shorter timeline for mm -hmm. uh you know just as far as having a wine scene and and you know actually brick and mortar wineries and yeah i feel like their reputation has kind of leapfrogged passos mm -hmm. in a way and a part of it is because they've really stuck to this regional identity on built on you know pinot and chardonnay and yeah one white one red right right here you go and i think you kind of have to stick to your guns like that in some ways and um in the old world they're they kind of you know they give you shit if you grow <laughs> pinot and syrah next to each other you know right. and to have you know Zinfandel, Cabernet, Syrah, and Pinot all growing next to each other in Paso, so it, it's maybe just a little bit unfocused. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's been hard for consumers to wrap their head around, you know, um, at least in the big wine markets in the world. You know, we have a great local market with built on tourism. Right. Um, but, you know, I still feel like we're underrepresented in New York, Chicago, you know. Um, yeah, probably a little bit in certain fine dining 100%. areas also. Right. No, there's two or three big wineries that you can probably find. But mm -hmm. and again, it's that the the pricing has been very aggressive in Paso and uh and I understand everyone has to make a living, but you know, if you're selling a bottle of wine for seventy five dollars in your tasting room, if you're trying to work with a distributor, you're selling that bottle to them for thirty five, forty, and then it's ending up on a restaurant list at, you know, 150 200 and mm -hmm. for 150 or 200 bucks you can buy some really nice wine i don't know if yeah. i would spend it on paso wine you know if mm -hmm. i was in a, a fine dining restaurant um and again as a person who absolutely loves paso but um so what was the idea behind making a, a blend as the as the wine that you come out with you have the val de gay and negret and yeah and this and so what was the idea behind wanting to combine those and release a blend as the the first wine out? You know, part of it was was built on again the the work of the South Africans and not just Butch, but also you know the work of the Saudi family. They felt like the more most important wines that they made were the regional wines, and mm -hmm. uh, again because they wanted to do that work of explaining the appellation to the consumer, and you know it's a little bit. Like if you drink Burgundy, you can't just drink Premier Cru Burgundy or mm -hmm. Grand Cru Burgundy. You have to understand the village level wines before you can work up to the greater crews. And not just in Paso, but in California, in the new world, you know, we kind of fetishize the single vineyards mm -hmm. uh, and everyone wants really specific wines from specific places. And my sort of problem with that is uh, if the consumer doesn't understand your region as a whole, the single vineyard doesn't make any sense. And so I felt like that was the, the more important work for me to do was try to explain the whole region. And, you know, it's I'm constantly shooting myself in the foot with, you know, my branding, my pricing, all of these okay. things. I'm just like a terrible <laughs> businessman. But it would be a lot easier for me to make 50 cases of each of these wines and because then everyone buys three bottles everyone buys one bottle of each yeah because uh, again everyone wants to try the new things and it's a lot harder to get people to buy 150 cases of one wine mm -hmm. um 
And it's, you know, again, it's, I wish people took wine a little bit more seriously and would just buy a case and drink a bottle every year until it kind of plateaus and then enjoy it when they're kind of think it's in the, the best spot. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I think the statistic is still like 95% of wine bought in California is drunk tonight. Right. You know, you know yeah. Um, yeah. So part of it is me, like, again, wanting to slow down sales. You know, I don't want this to be consumed immediately. And mm-hmm. uh, and again, like, I, I've i resisted doing tasting rooms or, or, you know, I have never done, like, a club release or anything like that. It's because I'm making so little wine right now. I mean, my mom would buy it all if, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, if I let her. Um, but it's, it's, you know... <laughs> And and there's a lot of that in the wine in the California wine world as well as you know people making small amounts of wine and mm-hmm. it disappears to friends and family and that's great it allows people to make wine and finance it and um, you know of course uh, but I do want the wine to get in front of more people than just my friends and family you know I, yeah. I, it is important for me to that the wine be in fine dining establishments, in serious restaurant, in serious wine shops, because um, they're like people will put it through the ringer and and mm-hmm. you know have to make judgment calls about the wine, and they won't just drink it because they like me. You know, it's, uh, um, <laughs> well, I think it or it helps with it sustainability like <laughs> in the end. Also, hopefully, um, I don't know. Tough to fully depend on friends and family yeah. to buy everything yeah, year no, exactly, after year exactly. after year. Yeah. And, you know, 100 cases won't support anything. You know, hopefully if one day I make 1,000 cases, I have a market that can absorb that. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Have you been sort of influenced by older California techniques in in the winemaking also? Definitely. You know, it's uh, a friend of mine who actually worked with me at, at All Height in 2017, Dave Scott. He was at UC Davis and... He was involved in their program with the Mandavi Institute to reprint a bunch of old California books. Okay. And one of the books he worked on was uh, Rixford's The Wine Press in the Cellar, mm, mm-hmm. which was kind of the first winemaking technical guide for the layperson in California. Yeah. Um, and it was mostly, you know, Rixford did it to help his fellow countrymen make better wine okay in the i think you wrote the book in 1883 it was mostly translation of other you know german and french and italian books but uh had a big impact on the industry i mean i think paul draper kind of famously said it was the book that taught him how to make wine okay and, um so that had a really big influence on me and for me yes i use a little bit of sulfur but i can cons- you know I kind of consider the wine to be natural wine. You know, there's no yeah. inoculation, there's no enzymes, no acids, no water, no reverse osmosis. Um, and for me, I think if you want to make wine like that, it's really important to look at how people were working a hundred years ago to make technically sound wine without uh, modern technology. Yeah, and yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Like we, you know, like biodynamics people you know, geek out about phases of the moon and things mm-hmm. like this. And and you read scientific winemaking te- textbooks from the 1800s, and they were also obsessed with the moon. Yeah. But it wasn't for the mystical properties of the moon. You know, if you read the if you read someone like Rixford, you know, they want you to make rackings at the equinoxes. And yeah. it wasn't because it was a symbolic moment. It was because... After the spring equinox, the days become longer, the vineyards start heating up, the cellar starts heating up, the wine starts going through fermentations again. And they kind of knew, you know, the enemy lives in the lees, you know, that's where Mm. Brett likes to hang out. So they want you to have clean, clear wine going into the warmer seasons. Um, So they, it's just kind of a, a pretty classic line, you know, the vine sympathizes with the wine Mm. or vice versa. Okay. But So anytime there's a big change in the vineyard, uh, there's also a change in the winery. <clears throat> yeah, um, and they kind of want you to to be on the lookout for that and, and uh, be aware of it. And so it's just small things like that. I tried to incorporate um, into into my winemaking. Um, I also try not to change things. You know, again, it's 
a lot of producers change things radically from year to year, whether it's mm, okay, whether it's artwork on the label, whether it's varietal composition, whether it's vineyard, you know, sources, winemaking techniques, you know, whole cluster, less whole cluster, new oak, less new oak, M4, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. longer maceration, shorter, hotter temperatures. And I understand that from the sense of wanting to make the best wine, but it's also, you know, I had 10 years and, you know, we would do 50 different or more ferments at Thatcher a year. And so I had, you know, sort of hundreds of ferments to sort of learn from. Yeah. And I was able to get a lot of my need for experimentation out through that. Okay. Yeah. And for, so for my own wine, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to make the wine one way and I'm not going to deviate vintage to vintage because if I start doing that, then when a consumer tastes the wine, again, it's not their region shining through. It's my stylistic choices as a winemaker. And, you know, clearly from my first vintage, I'm making stylistic choices, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not immune to it. But if I keep my, my technical decisions consistent year to year, at least when the consumer tastes wine from vintage to vintage, hopefully the changes that they discern through the lineup will be the changes in the region, the vintage, the weather, uh, shining through and not, you know, sort of my ego or my effort to make a, a, a better wine, the best wine, you know, it's, yeah. I made the best decisions, the most informed decisions I could going into the project. And sort of the reason I took so long is I didn't want to be selling my first wines to be, you know, my tinkering with the wines, my experiments, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, you wanted it to come out as a, like a fully formed, fully formed brand and, and wine and yeah, yeah. kind of like really hit the ground running exactly. with it. Exactly. And again, it's, you know, trying to just transmit the region to mm -hmm. the best of my ability. And, and I think if I came from, you know, a winemaking family and I had a lot of, you know, experience to draw on not just my own experience, but, you know, my family's collective experiences, making changes in the vintage, in a difficult vintage mm -hmm. or in an exceptional vintage, that would, I think that means more than me deciding to use more whole cluster or more, or do carbonic fermentation or longer macerations or mm -hmm. something like that. You know, just if I had a hundred years of collective experience behind me and I was trying to do the the best work I could do on that one, I'd be more open to changing. But for now, I'd rather sacrifice that, you know, a little bit of the quality if it means a more consistent message mm -hmm. through the wine. Mm -hmm. Are you destemming most of the grapes or is it a whole cluster? Or? Uh, I do some a little bit more just because, you know, when you go 100%, you kind of can feel it. Not just 100% whole cluster, but if I want 100% destem, or if I used, if you use 100% new oak, or you use 100% neutral barrels, mm -hmm. that uh, extremity kind of dominates in a way. Mm -hmm. And for me, this whole thing is just like an exercise in moderation. Like, how do you make the most moderate wine possible? Because the extremities, if you have really extreme wines, mm -hmm. if it's extreme whole cluster, or whatever, again, that sticks out more than the region. So I want to eliminate, you know, it, I don't want the consumer to drink the wine and say, oh, like really nice whole clusters in here, you know, yeah. like it's a little bit stemmy. I think that would be a distraction in the same way that if the consumer can notice new oak in the wine, I think that's also a distraction. Mm -hmm. Or the absence of new oak, you know, if, it, if it's a little bit musty from, from neutral oak, I think that would also be a distraction. Um, or if it has carbonic character. If mm -hmm. the first thing the person says is, wow, like, really nice carbonic character on the wine. To me, that's the wines fail to represent the region because the first thing the consumer is talking about is the technical uh, details. And mm -hmm. again, it's, it's part of the reason why I make a blend. Um, you know, I don't want people to drink the wine and be like, cool, Valdegay, like this tastes, this is what Valdegay tastes yeah. like, you know, I want to, obscure the varietal composition a little bit and i don't put the varietals on the back label of okay. the wine either it's just the 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 growers and then the ampelography and the cluster morphology of the of the grapes so if you're 
a hardcore nerd, you can tell what's in it, but otherwise, because uh, I don't want the consumer to buy it because they're, again, trying something, they want to try something new. I want them to buy it because they want to come to a better understanding about my area. And um, so the same is true of the winemaking. It's ID STEM. It's not even really important to me how much ID STEM, It's but it's typically 75 to 90% whole bunches. And then I D stem a little bit on top, uh, everything goes into old oak vessels, mm -hmm. uh, open top oak vessels, sure. um, which is a glamorous way of saying uh, barrels with their heads taken yeah. off. <laughs> but, uh, um, I do crush the whole cluster portions, you know, okay. just old school foot stomping. Yeah. Again, like I don't want the carbonic character. So right. it's pretty light and foot stomping, but... Um, and I do want juice for for fermentation, um, and then after that, I seal the the vessels for ten or twelve days, basically until I can see fermentation in the vessels. I ferment super cold. Everything goes in. You know, I'm not temperature controlling, but everything goes into the the barrel room, so mm -hmm. 55 degrees, 56 degrees, and um, I want long, slow fermentations. And um, every once the wine's fermenting, I'll do a punch down uh, once a day. I mean, literally just like with my hand, just push mm -hmm. it down and the wine never goes through a pump. I just, okay. again, with without using sulfur, you know, I use sulfur after malolactic, but like mm -hmm. I just sulfured my 2022 20, wines earlier this week because they'd finally finished mallow, you know, okay. in, in July. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, if you've ever taken apart a, a pump, like no matter how many chemicals you've sent through the pump, the pump is never clean. So if you're trying to make natural wine, I think pumps can be, can harbor a lot of bacteria. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I kind of would rather the vineyard or the wine show vineyard microbiology rather than cellar microbiology. So yeah. I, I try to avoid uh, the big B. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's one spends 50 or 60 days on skins and stems. It gets uh, basket pressed, um, goes into small barrels for the first six months of its life. And uh, in the small barrels, they, they are a little bit more oxidative. They breathe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. It's all second or third fill from other people, you know, and that's the nice thing about Paso is there's lots of cheap, you know, used barrels that yeah, are pretty clean. Yeah, and uh, I make a racking, you know, according to Rixford in March before the equinox and okay. blend the wine to tank and then rack by gravity back. And I return the, the wine to uh, 500 liter punchins. Okay. Um, and if I had to, one day I'd love to afford Fudras and just return it to mm. Fudras. And basically once the wine's done with its fermentations, I want to kind of slow down breathing and put it into more reductive mm -hmm. vessels and, uh, and just tighten it up a little bit. So... And that's the only movement the wine gets. The you know I, I try not to fiddle with it too much. I try not to taste the wine too much. You know, it's uh, I try to keep the barrels very still and not move them. For me, CO two is sort of my ally. I really want right. to preserve as much carbon dioxide in the wine as possible, mm -hmm. um, just to to keep out oxidation in a a natural way. And, yeah. Um, are you co-fermenting the varieties or are they separate not fermentations? Currently. Okay. They're I keep everything separate for now, press separately and yeah. and age separately. Okay. It's not super important to me that I do that. Um but I am just trying to track the individual fermentations. Mm -hmm. You know, in ten years, if I am lucky enough to work with the same vineyard sources for that long, I think I'd be more comfortable laying things ferment together that show up on the same day or pressing things and barreling them down together. But right now I am trying to just understand what, how, you know, what the different vineyard sources bring to the table. Sure. Also in the future, I, you know, I would really like to uh, be able to sort of deconstruct the wine. Okay. If I can make a sort of critical amount of this one wine, then I would be comfortable putting aside a, a barrel or so of each or however much it is mm -hmm. of each different vineyard and bottling those on their own so that the consumer can then taste the single vineyard components. Mm -hmm. And again, like if you're going to pay big bucks for wine and, or if you're going to charge big bucks for wine, 
you need to be doing work to describe the area to people. And at some point, I'll get to the point where I feel like I've reached enough people with the main line, and the next step will be to provide the single vineyard uh, uh, components as a, you know, just so people can understand the different aspects of the different different size of the Appalachians, different soil types. Of course, the varietal composition, I'm, I don't want to emphasize that, but mm-hmm. that will be part of the single vineyard bottlings as well. So. Right. Do you have thoughts about a white wine potentially in the same vein? Definitely. I I would love to. And I, th- I think I'm a better white wine maker than I am red wine maker. Just, you know, I thought you were mostly making red wine. In South Africa, we were mostly making white wine. Mm-hmm. I feel like I was a, just, I'm not sure why. Maybe it's, maybe I'm not, I don't know. But I just feel like I really want to crack at the white wines. Mm-hmm. The thing though is, you know, there just isn't as much white vine material around that kind of fits the parameters of the project. In okay. South Africa, you know, during their bad years, they gear their industry towards distillation. Hmm. And so okay. they save their white vineyards. So there's Old Vine Shenan, Old Vine Semyon, Old Vine Palmino. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of an outlier. Most of the rest of the world tended to save their old red vineyards, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's Argentina with their Malbec, Shiraz in Australia, Zinfandel in California, whatever it is. Um, so there's just not as much white material around here. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you have to, you kind of have to put aside your own personal uh, uh like what you want to make and make what the region kind of is best suited for and and mm-hmm. to me it seems like there's just more red old varieties around that i can work with and um i think it would yeah again i'm looking forward to having a crack at it there's shannon vineyards i'd love to work with there's a palomino vineyard i'd really like to mm-hmm. work with mm-hmm. um um but I, I also you know I don't want to make single vineyard wine and even two vineyards, you know, if you're bottling wines, a single vineyard wine is sort of a monologue. Two vineyards is a dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's not until you have three or more vineyards that you actually have a full conversation going on mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. wine. Um, so I kind of need just more than two sources and, and the more sources I'm able to include sort of the more, the more true the wine would be. And, and that's, kind of the next step for the red wine is just including more vineyard sources, more varieties. Because if I can obscure, the more varieties I include, the more vineyard sources, the more I obscure the single varietal and single vineyard characteristics. And hopefully it's just the the voice of the region kind of coming through. And so hopefully we'll just get a little bit more pure as the, as the project evolves. Mm -hmm. Um, it was all about purchasing power and yeah. uh, what I can do, and and this is what I can do right now. Yeah, so. yeah. What's the idea behind the packaging for the name? And is the is the label is that from the Rixford book? It was definitely inspired by the Rixford okay. book. You want to try it real quick? Or? Yeah. The label is definitely inspired by the Rixford book, um, but it was also inspired by a lot of sort of wine propaganda from when people knew prohibition was coming through. There was. Okay. Uh, a big effort to kind of align beer and wine as the the voice of temperance and, and mm-hmm. moderation mm-hmm. and not, you know, demon demon rum or demon whiskey or Yeah. And so you would see a lot of this propaganda usually that had sort of Lady Liberty, a California grizzly bear, opening champagne, either be barrels or presses. Um and that was kind of the the vibe of the illustration at the front of the Rixford book. Mm-hmm. But I kind of tweaked it a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm also originally from Virginia, and the state seal of Virginia is mm-hmm. an Amazon woman who's killed a king or tyrant, you know, kind of the okay. six emperor tyrannus. And um, yeah. so I kind of replaced the Lady Liberty with the, the Amazon Amazonian. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the California Grizzly is there. They're both hanging out in front of an old school basket press. And then... Uh, the king is naked and at her feet dethroned. So yeah, um, yeah. So it's you know, I did want to have that classical feel of, and I I, I looked through a bunch of old you know Italian Swiss labels, mm, old Gallo yeah, labels, yeah. Um, and even the bottle shape is uh, 
you know, it's it's kind of a cool bottle shape. It's brown glass. Yeah, and, it's very uh, cool. Uh, it's what was called California Hawk, which was actually developed by Almaden back in the fifth, you know, post World War Two. Okay. Riesling bottles were a little bit taller and didn't fit on people's shelves with the the uh, Burgundy and Bordeaux bottles, so they kind of shortened the the California uh, Riesling bottle. And um, you know, it's it's I'm not making Bordeaux and I'm not making Burgundy, so oh, well, I, I do call it California Burgundy, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so maybe I should put it in a Burgundy bottle. But this was like just such a unique, uniquely Californian bottle. And, yeah. You know, I don't want people. I think people get a little bit silly with the outrageous bottle shape sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to. I don't want that to be a huge focus of um, luxuriantly heavy glass and that sort of thing. But I do want sure. people to be like, that looks like it could be a really old bottle of wine. You know, yeah, it doesn't look super modern. So. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, after you know. Whole cluster inclusion after Mallow, the wine clocks in. This is the the original wine, so this is the 2020. It's 3.7 pH and 12.8 percent alcohol, and you know, again, that's yeah. without any additions at all. It's just what the region wanted to give, and um, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are surprised because they're kind of used to a lot of bombers from Paso. You know, the 15, 16 percent. <laughs> Sure. alcohol wines and uh you know it's really i'm very happy that you know the region can make wines like this and i think it actually does want to make wines like this you hear a lot of people talk in paso about waiting for the acid to fall out and just okay. the soils in paso especially on the west side are so basic and so calcareous based the wines do have extreme phs like mm-hmm. In my old days at Thatcher, you know, we would look at chemistry at, you know, be waiting to pick grapes, you know, Zinfandel at, or Grenache at 27 bricks and 3.1 pH. Oh, you wow. Know. Okay. So I understand why people say that. But with whole cluster inclusion and with malolactic, the wine ends up sort of right in the in the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was kind of a surprise to me, but like a, a very happy surprise. And again, it it could be me just forcing my interpretation <laughs> on the region, but I'm really trying hard not to do that. Um, so I do think like this is a wine that the region really wants to produce. And also these varieties that have a long history in California, you know, 150 years or more, I think they've seen everything California kind of wants to throw at them. And all of these grapes, I mean, since so at, 22 bricks is like the seeds are brown like black you know like nothing left to there's no no place to go yeah the fruit is like still crunchy uh it just the acid is starting to creep up like 22 bricks is the right place to pick it mm-hmm. negret at again 21 and a half 22 bricks is so ripe it's so lignified the crew doesn't even use clippers to pick it they just pop it off with their fingers like it's yeah, okay. it's so ready to go and you you actually yeah, there is just like falling w- falling off <laughs> I, I i just realized the negret's the one thing i don't destem because um i tried to destem a little bit my first year and it just eviscerated the fruit like oh it was just exploded. so exploded so yeah. ready to the, go the skins were so soft and i mean you could hold it in your hand and it, you could feel yourself bruising the the fruit. Um, and then Val de Gay, you know, I think there's kind of a reason why like growers used to put into California Burgundy, you know, mm-hmm. and everyone used to make, you know, it was a big chunk of Billy Vineyards Burgundy. Um, everyone back in the day used to make, make Burgundy and, and the Napa Gamay, as they called it at the time, or Val de Gay was always a big percentage of it. And I mean, even like the, the prisoners, like, sort of a California Burgundy, you know, and right. uh, the, it just, it gets to 24 bricks and it just stays for weeks and, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it gets there and just hangs out and eventually you start losing the city, but it doesn't really accumulate that much sugar after okay. that. So I'm not trying to force these grapes and pick them early. I think that would be a mistake, but mm-hmm. I do think these 
varieties tend to try and, you know, they know it's a long, hot season and they want to get the fruit off and shut down. And, you know, uh, whereas something like French clones of Cabernet, what used to Bordeaux, they just want to keep chugging and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and just accumulate sugar until the, and Grenache, no different. I mean, Grenache will get to 30, yeah. five bricks if you mm-hmm. let it, you know, um, and again, I think a lot of that is just those recent imported clones just aren't used to California. And, um, you know, they, they kind of went from shifting. You know, they've been transplanted from, from, you know, wherever in France, but they haven't had time to shift gears to adapt to California's weather and, and climate and rainfall. And mm-hmm. um, I think these grapes kind of have. And um, Yeah, like you said, that Senso was pre sort of uc davis right definitely um, so it's been here been here for a while and adapted to it and if you read uh thomas i think Pinney is his name he wrote like the history of wine in america part one and two okay he wrote a book called the city of vines all about the wine industry in los angeles right and he kind of talks about what was considered the biggest vineyard in the world at the time the 18 18- maybe 1885 or 1890. Okay. It was in LA and it was uh, the Nadu Vineyard. It was 2,500 acres. And I think 25% of it was Cinso. Really? And okay. he had kind of the records of what was planted and when. And the first grapes that were planted were Mission and Cinso. And then the Mission plantings tapered off. Cinso kept going strong. And then Zinfandel came in at the end. And... Cinso was kind of the fix-it grape. Mm. Uh, with the mission, the mission didn't have good enough color and it didn't accumulate enough sugar. So they were using Cinso to give it more color and more alcohol. Okay. And then when people had access to Zinfandel, Zinfandel kind of had just the opposite problem where it was too much acidity, mm-hmm. too much alcohol, and Cinso could kind of moderate the extremity of Zinfandel. Um, I just went, I was just working harvest in Chile in March and April with uh, Pedro Parra. Okay. And the reason I went down there was because he was working with, you know, what they call Pais, which is our, our mission. Right. And Cinso. And so there's a little bit of a parallel there where, you know, their industry, all their country wines were historically from Pais. And uh, eventually they went to the government for help because they needed something that would give the wines more body for the bulk export market. And uh, Cinso was the grape that the Chilean government provided for them. And they'd seen how well it worked in Algeria, basically. And okay. uh, so it's just kind of funny, you know, these, and the same with Cinso in South Africa was, you know, it was used to stretch Cabernet. There's lots mm. of South African Cabernet that's like 75% Cinso and, you know, just enough Cabernet <laughs> to legally call it cab And uh, uh, it's just kind of funny that that grape in all these different areas was all performing the same sort of function. Yeah. And there's some some real little Cinso out in Lodi, the mm-hmm. yeah. vineyard. Right. I think Randall Graham was the first to realize I that it was so. actually Cinso. But, yeah. They called um, it uh, Malvasia Negra, I think, for a long is that time. What, okay. That's what the Italians called it. And it was called originally Black Malvoisie or Black right. Malvoisia. Yeah. Um, and there used to be, I've never found the statistic on how much used to be planted, but I'm pretty sure it was like thousands of acres or maybe tens of thousands of acres. Um, because if you read anything from turn of the century, they say Cinso was already in disrepute and decline by the 1890s. So it was already okay. <laughs> the acreage was already declining, but if you look at the grape uh, grape acreage reports from I think it's 1971, there were still 800 acres of Black Malvoisie in the state. Okay. So even after being in decline for 80 years, there were still almost a thousand acres. And when I started working with it at Thatcher. There was, I think, 72 acres, and that was 2015 or 16, 2015. Okay. Uh, it's climbed slightly. I think now there's 
Last time I checked, which was maybe a year or two ago, there was 92 acres. Okay. And I think most of that's recent Tablas Creek imported material. Mm-hmm. So people have kind of been interested in, in, you know, sort of fleshing out their GSM blends with, you know, kind of expanding the, the Chateauneuf portfolio in California. Yeah. Um, well, that's, maybe that's a good subject to touch on as well is just as to why I made the blend the way that I did. Something like the the GSM blend, mm-hmm. uh, those grapes mix great sense together, but it's basically a blueprint from Chateauneuf de Pop, and it was sort of applied to Paso, in right. the same way that you know the Bordeaux blend, you know that blueprint has been applied, um, and they're good jumping off points, but to stick to those protocols and those blueprints, it's a little bit. Um, why are we taking the recipe that works in Chateauneuf and just directly applying it to Paso? Mm-hmm. You know, it's we need to kind of expand things a little bit. And um, that was kind of part of the reason for, I made the blend that I did and not a, another Paso GSM, you know, mm-hmm. um, just because I didn't want to be defined as kind of a Chateauneuf knockoff or a Bordelais knockoff or I speak ad nauseum about my time in South Africa and the, you know, of course they've had a disproportionate effect on me. And I think it would be easy for people to, you know, talk to me about the wine and think, oh, well, like clearly he's just influenced by South Africa, just the way some people are are influenced by Burgundy or Tuscany or, you know, Bordeaux or Mm -hmm. whatever. But that's not really true. I think what really captured my imagination about or in South Africa was those guys were obsessed with making South African wine and how do you make mm. South African wine and kind of shake off, you know, the economic and marketing powers of that hold sway over, over your industry. And, and can you really accurately reflect your own appellation through the blueprints of another appellation Mm -hmm. and i think you know stellenbosch is there's lots of kind of napa knockoffs and and things like that and but i think the really exciting producers have kind of rejected that and and said you know what we need to carve our own path reevaluate our history the genetic material we have available to us i mean the same thing's happening all over the world is Mm -hmm. um you know whether it's in in sicily people kind of rejecting international Varieties and and re-embracing Caracante or Nero yeah. Diablo or, I mean, Chile, the same thing is, you know, there's a big struggle between, you know, you have oceans of not even old vine pice, like ancient vine pice, 200-year-old pice, mm-hmm. and it's unappreciated. And most of the world knows it through, you know, sort of industrially made Cabernets and, mm-hmm. and or Malbec or whatever it is. And, um so for me, it was just like, you know, how do you make a uniquely Californian wine? And you kind of have to use grapes. To me, it's like you have to use grapes that aren't really present anywhere else in the world. You know, mm-hmm. Valdegue is from the Languedoc, but it no longer exists there. Cabernet Pfeffer is originally from Bordeaux, but no longer exists there. Um, Sinso is kind of still surviving pretty well around the world. Um, not really mm-hmm. in California, but again, something that there used to be pretty extensive plantings of and and now there's almost nothing it's it's worth kind of locking on to that and mm-hmm. trying to celebrate it um, if people want to find the wine unfortunately i'm not the right person to ask about it so uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, again i'm just like economically suicidal but uh, uh so Revel Wine works with it in California, and okay. that's a new relationship. Um, so we're we're just getting started with that, but I'm really excited with them, and it's kind of a portfolio of like all of my California heroes and a lot of the guys I and ladies I draw inspiration from. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very cool to be included in that book. I'm I'm really excited about that and and moving forward with that relationship, and then. Um, uh, Polaner Selections in New York takes the rest of the wine, so it's pretty much okay. split 50-50 between the two. And again, another book that's like, you know, not just California, 
you know, inspirations, but a lot of old world inspirations. It's yeah. really pretty. I feel very lucky to be included in both those those books. Um, yeah, I, I try not to sell my own wine. It's just like I don't want to deal with. It's much easier for me to send a pallet of wine to each spot and get two checks in return rather than sell, you know, a thousand bottles of wine one at a time and collect checks mm-hmm. and credit cards and cash and mm-hmm. do my own. My bookkeeping is very simple right now. Yeah, I bet. Like keep yeah. It that way. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a, it is a better margin. I should, I'm sure one day I'll, I'll do like a mailing list or something, but yeah. right now I just don't have the energy to do uh, my day job, do the winemaking here at night. I mean, it's super labor intensive. I mean, even though the fermentations and everything are simple, like we bottled this by hand. I okay. sat down and literally hand labeled every bottle by hand, which uh, yeah, it was great when it was a hundred cases. Next year, it's a little bit, a little bit of a jump in production. It's going to be a painful couple weeks of okay hand labeling that night. And uh, what'd you jump up to? Uh, I made about two sixty, two seventy five last okay. year, and this year will be. You know, I, I left my job at Thatcher, um, and uh, I'm focusing th- on this a little bit more, uh, and it should be about 500 cases or so. so okay. Make Great. a break. <laughs> yeah, so kind of doubling well, just about every yeah. year so far. <laughs> Almost like a real winery. I mean, uh, yeah, at some point, you can't you can't just make a couple barrels. you got to, you know, make it support you. So, mm-hmm. uh, as painful and uh <laughs> it's gonna be a long couple of years but looking forward to it so thanks for listening to our episode today with daniel as he mentioned he wanted to come out with a fully formed wine including all the packaging and i really feel like he's done that i can't tell you where to try the wine as you heard but hopefully your local shop that works with his distributors can track it down i was really impressed with it you can follow daniel on instagram at Slam Dance Cooperative Wines. And you can follow the podcast on wherever you're listening and the Instagram at Indie Wine Podcast. Feel free to email indiewinepodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or feedback. If you could tell your wine friends about the podcast too and help spread the word, I'd really appreciate it. Rating or subscribing helps too. There's also now a Patreon setup if you feel like supporting the podcast monetarily to hopefully allow for more episodes or travel, and to help defray other costs. The link is in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode. Have a good one.